is Thursday, October 27, 2022. And I'm Frank Grace. I'm here with Bill Cohen to talk about his life and career as a lawyer. And Bill, let's just start off with talking about your family, your history growing up. I grew up primarily in New Jersey. My father worked in New York. He was an audiologist for the Veterans Administration. My mother went back to school and became a school teacher. She taught mathematics. And I had one sister who's four years older than me. She now lives in California and was a professor at the University of Hartford for a number of years, teaching reading and uh, some classes, other classes as well. So you went to public schools in New Jersey? Public schools in New Jersey. All the way through high school? All the way through high school. Where, where in New Jersey? A place called Teaneck, it's about nine to 10 miles outside New York City. When it came time for college, what did you say? I spent my first year at the University of Wisconsin. I was there in 1969 and 70. It was the year of many riots. And uh, it was the year that they eventually blew up the Army Math Research Center. Um, and then I transferred to Rutgers University, Brunswick, New Jersey, and completed my undergraduate college there. What did you major in? History. If you finished your undergraduate education, do you have any plans for further education or do you have some kind of career in mind? Oh, I knew I was going to law school from about ninth grade on. So um, as soon as I could, I applied to law school. And where'd you apply? Um, and ultimately, where were you accepted? Uh, ultimately applied and it was accepted at Georgetown. Let's see. In the day program? Day program. How many people were in your class roughly? Uh, it was four sections of 125 in the day program, and I think another 125 in the night program. So a man manageable size, yeah. overwhelming. Size. Oh, we had large classes. Yeah. At least first year was pretty large. What year was that you started law school? 73. Um, any particular Focus in law school? Or? I originally went to law school thinking I'd be a poverty lawyer. So I worked for a uh, housing um, organization in law school. I thought that was interesting. And then uh, my second year, I started drifting towards more trial work. And I worked for a place called the DC Bail Agency, which was now the equivalent of pretrial services federal system. And so I got to go to court uh, a bunch. And we would, as part of our, our jobs, we would make bond recommendations. So we would then sit in the courtroom and uh, if the judge had questions, we'd answer those questions. And I got to see defense lawyers and prosecutors. And I said, that's what I want to do. So my third year, I was in the juvenile justice clinic where we represented juveniles both in criminal cases and in cases of abuse, we would be the advocates for the, uh, the children. I like to be in court. So, okay, that's what I want to do for a career. You take any particular evidence courses or, or, or uh, procedure courses? I took evidence. Um, I took a forensic uh, analysis course, taught uh, third semester, second semester, third year. Uh, which was interesting. Um, I also took a course it's called street law and uh, together with a friend of mine, we taught law in a prison, Morton prison, which in, was a pretty secure facility. I think we had four murderers in our class. It was an interesting experience. Uh, but I made friends with one of the inmates and we communicated after law school for about 15 years. And then I took another course, and I don't remember what it's called, but it was taught by an adjunct professor, which was more um, geared towards criminal law and the actual processes of criminal law, like suppression motions, things like that. And then I took the usual stuff to, pay, to make sure I could pass the bar. 
And then the summers in law school, you know, law related work. Or First summer, I worked for the Environmental Protection Agency as a law clerk, and the second summer, I worked for the DC Bail Agency. I know somewhere along the line you got married. I know that. Yeah. When did when did all that happen? What um, did you that? I got married after my second year of law school and my wife's first year of graduate school. But we had known each other. We started dating in high school. So, as law school started to come to a close, what, 76 would it have been? I, I graduated in May of 76, yes. What were your career plans if you had any? Well, I wanted to go be an assistant United States attorney. Why? I saw them. Um, in D.C., it's different. In D.C., the AUSAs are also the state prosecutors for most of the offenses. I thought that would be a great job. And I wanted to be uh, a prosecutor or defense lawyer. At that point, I was looking at, at both. And it's basically, where can I get a job? I wanted to do either defense work or like the Federal Public Defender's Office or go to be a... Uh, prosecutor and I knew the way I, coming out of law school I wasn't going to get a job so I knew the way to get make myself much more marketable was to be a law clerk or a judge I also wanted to do that but that would be a good experience for me to get that sort of uh, background and so I started applying to many federal district judges around the nation as well as um, uh, Superior Court judges in D.C., which is the trial level in D.C. How does that work for the federal judgeship? Is it just a blanket list of available jobs by district, or how did you know at where to apply? At that point in time, I looked at places I wanted to live and sent out resumes of places I wanted to live. Okay. And I applied to Nashville specifically because a friend of mine was going to Vanderbilt Law School. After his first year, he said he hated Nashville. After his second year, uh, when he came to my wedding, he said, no, I really love Nashville. I said, what, what's, what happened? He said, I didn't realize I hated law school, not Nashville. So I added Nashville to the list of places to uh, apply. Had a few interviews uh, in Tennessee and in some in Texas, and was fortunate to get the job with Claire Morton here in Nashville. And that was in '76. Started in '76, and uh, did one or two years. It, Judge Morton kept his clerks for two years. Okay. Um, who, who was who else was clerking with him at that time? Uh, I replaced Lynn Howard. And the other clerk was Ken King. Right. So Ken and I had a year together. So both of them practiced here in Bittentown. Right. And then when Ken left, Julie Jones, who I believe went to Bass Berry, um, came in and, and was the second law clerk. And what did you do for Judge Morton? Anything he asked me to do. And what did he ask you to do? Um, Obviously, I, I suspect research and writing. And research, memos and what, what? Re research and writing and um, brought me into court. He knew I liked courtrooms, so he let me come into the courtroom from time to time. Um, and um, whatever he needed, we did. Prepare jury instructions. Um, one day, for one trial, uh, there were, he had no clerk, so I was the clerk for the trial. The courtroom deputy for the trial. So, whatever he needed, uh, I did. And I assume you interviewed with him personally before you got the job. Yes. What was that like? Because he had a reputation here when he came to town two years before this now, being very formidable, kind of gruff. For those who didn't know him, yes, he was formidable and gruff. Um, before I did the interview, I sat in this courtroom, got in there early enough watched him in court, so I was able to ask him questions about what had gone on. Uh, Judge Morton had bad eyes, and he had a bad habit, or he had the habit of doing this all the time. And he did that during my interview. And I remember calling my wife up that night and said, not going to get the job because he kept rubbing his eyes, not knowing that that was what he did. Uh, 
And about a month or two after I interviewed, I got a call from the secretary, Marsha Greer, and she said, Judge Moore would like you to join him. He said, okay. And so I moved to Nashville. And that would have been what, the fall of 78? Mm -hmm. Summer of 78? No, 76. 76. 76. 76. I started, I think we moved down in August and started around the latter part of August, first part of September. Which the 78 takes me to my next series of questions. 78, you finished up with Judge Wright and got another job. Right. Well, what happened was I was applying for jobs after I finished my first year, and I went over and spoke to the people at the U.S. Attorney's Office, particularly Joe Brown and Hal Hardin. And at that point in time, it really was very much a court family. Um, I was over in the U.S. Attorney's Office um, because they had the only computer on which we could do legal research. The courts didn't have legal research capacity at that point in time. So I was over there. I got to know the people. Um, they invited me when Charlie Fells uh, re uh, moved to Australia. They invited me to come and um, be and be at the party, be at his get well uh, go away party. Um, and so it became a real family. So I applied to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the slot opened up. Harry Blackbird who had left. He had replaced Gary, and he left. And a slot was opening up. So I had applied for the job and uh, interviewed with Hal, interviewed with Joe, and uh, I, Judge Morton released me early. He released me in May to go take the job with Hal. And my replacement, who was Dale Grimes, was graduating. So he came in a little bit earlier uh, than he would have otherwise. And Judge Morton was very. Nice to let me do that. Maybe he wanted to get rid of me. I don't know. That, uh, well, Henry, a lot of us, mostly lawyers, are looking at this and reading and, and uh, thinking back in their own careers. We have an idea of how we started out in either a law firm or individually, but not many of us had experience with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, but you had civil and criminal responsibility, correct? Correct, at that point, and yes. Just tell me how the office was structured and how you as a first, first year guy fit in. What were your duties? Um, whatever they told me to do, again, um, I handled the petty offense docket, so I was trying all of the uh, misdemeanor cases that occurred on VA property or the Corps of Engineers property, which in fact was a lot of fun because I got to try a lot of cases and got to be in court a lot and got to cross-examine people, which young prosecutors typically don't get to do. So that was fun. Um, I think part of the reason I was hired was for my research capabilities. I don't think the office had someone with that background, although there were very, very bright people there. Joe Brown is extremely bright, but I was hired for my research ability. So I was doing some research and then I lucked out. Uh, Joe Brown selected me to help out on the parties and paroles case. And I'd been there for probably five, six months. And he said, I'd you like to get involved in this case? And I said, okay. And so I was involved in the parties and paroles case. Well, Joe was a senior. Assistant U.S. Attorney. He's the first that, assistant at that yeah, point. Okay. And he, that was his primary assignment at that point was to plan and pardon and parole. Well, we were eight people and we had lots of cases. So it was pardons and paroles, yes, was very, very important and took up a lot of time. But we still had other cases to do. We, we weren't exclusively doing those sorts of cases. And what was your involvement with that? Uh, I was involved, and I had to learn everything going in. I met Hick Ewing, who was the first assistant down in uh, Memphis, and we were coordinating with them. And I was involved in, in all of the aspects of, of the case. Grand jury, uh, the, days, the day of the uh, um, 
the searches, uh, I was delegated to go down to the office of the pardon paroles, and I sat away from where they were searching, and the agents had questions about what they should take and what they shouldn't take, they would come and talk to me. Um, and it was full involvement in the case. Obviously, I was the low man in the totem pole. I was the least experienced person. Both Joe and Hick had lots and lots of experience. So they were, you know, they had the big oars, but whatever they needed done. I was doing a lot of research, things of that nature for them. And, and when the case was charged, I was, I was again, third man on the totem pole. So when uh, Judge Neese announced four days before trial that he wanted all the witnesses brought into court so the jurors could take, prospective jurors could take a look at them before, as we were doing jury selection. I got to call 140 witnesses and try and get them to Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. So those sorts of things. But as the case went on, I had my share of witnesses and things to do. So I was a full member of the team. You mentioned that there were other cases going on, obviously, in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I happen to remember, recall that there was a, a parallel investigation into liquor licenses. Right. Did you have anything to do I with I was that? involved in the initial stages of that investigation when they were, um, Jack Ham was his name, Jack Ham, and there were a couple of people who were involved in, with him. One was a guy named Bernie something, I think. He was an architect. Bernie Weinstein? Bernie, maybe Bernie Weinstein. And then at a point in time, there was so much work to do that case was split off to Bob Lynch and Alea Trauger. And Marty's Paul's case was then, that's all I worked on. Okay. So the, the searches, uh, you mentioned searches, I think those were in December of 78. That's correct. And what all was served? What, what areas or offices were searched? Well, I know Eddie Sisk's office was searched, the um, office of uh, the, the pardons proles office was searched. That's where I got to meet Charles Trogger and spend a lot of time with him. Uh, I know Joe went out because at the time the searches went down, Charlie Benson was flying, either flying into Nashville or flying out of Nashville with uh, a pardon, and Joe went out there with the agents who went out and arrested Charlie Benson at the airport. There may have been another place that was searched. Those are the three that come to mind. Now, what was Ch Charlie Benson? What was his job in the? He worked. He was the extradition officer. He worked under Eddie Sisk. Now, when when were the charges brought? Uh, we. We got an extension uh, under the Speedy Trial Act um, to indict the case, and I think it was February or March when the indictments were finally filed. I don't really recall the date, but it was it was early '79. As I recall, Blant was not involved personally in that part of the federal investigations. We looked at him. There was not evidence to support a an indictment of him. And you stayed on Joe's team uh, through the prosecution of Sisk, Sisk, Benson, and right, the others. The others. Okay. How long did all that take? It seemed like forever. Well, part of the part of the issue was um, it was indicted under the RICO case, the RICO statute, which was uh, a very novel thing at that point in time. And I, that was one of the things that I worked on quite a bit, preparing the government's briefs. Um, and we wanted the district court level. And uh, the author of the uh, RICO Act was a guy named Robert Blakely, who's a professor, I think he was at Notre Dame then. He came down and we talked. Um, and then we went up to the Court of Appeals, and we were the that was the first district, uh, first court that reversed, saying that the governor's office was not a uh, enterprise under the RICO statute that was 
it's supposed to be Bob statute. Filed a motion for reconsideration. Joe argued that one in front of the entire court when we won. That went in front of there. So trial was delayed for a good bit while those proceedings were going on. And I think there was a succession of trial judges for right. one reason or another. Well, we started out with Judge Deese, um, which was an interesting experience. Um, we were not, we had not concluded our proof. He had a heart attack. And then Judge Merritt was appointed to, in his stead, and then Judge Merritt um, declared a mistrial. And then uh, the judge from Michigan, Judge Churchill, was appointed and he came down and, and ultimately sat uh, and tried the case when we tried Charlie Benson. The other defendants, the other primary defendants, uh, Eddie Sisk and uh, Fred Thompson had pled guilty by that point in time. Trial. Not Fred Thompson. No, 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 no. Not Fred Thompson. Was Bill Thompson? It was Bill Thompson and, oh, I'm getting his name wrong. Thank you. And Fred Taylor. I'm sorry, it's Fred Taylor. You're right. Fred Taylor was the um, state trooper who was charged. And Dale Quillen was dismissed out of the out of the case, and there were uh, there's a guy named right Bill Thompson from Chattanooga was one of the people. He was one of the ones who was arranging that he was not an official, but he was arranging that, and he pled guilty as well. Well, at some point that case was tried, and with the guilty pleas you indicated, that case was tried. Um, there had to be life after the plant case. What, what, what did you do next? It took a rest for a while. No, we went right on and, and just, I tried all sorts of cases. And uh, in the beginning when I started, I did civil and criminal. Um, I quickly decided civil was not my cup of tea. I didn't like it. So eventually I sort of moved over to the criminal and we and, I did try a civil case. I was on uh, the swine flu. Do you remember the swine flu? We all got our swine flu shots in 1976, 77, and a lot of people got sick. And I got to represent the government in those cases. I won three of them. What was what was what was, what was the litigation about? Uh, that a particular disease, Guillain Barre, was caused by the swine flu shot. And there were other people who were alleging other uh, sicknesses were called caused by the swine flu shot. Uh, I tried one of those cases in front of Judge Morton and lost a $2.8 million verdict, which was reduced down to $2 million. So um, well, what was the government's, the United States culpability in all of this? Uh, the government had agreed because the um, companies who do manufacturing companies, the drug companies had not tested it to assume liability. And then the government with certain diseases to the on beret stipulated liability. So my case went to trial solely on the issue of damages. And it was a case that could have been settled and I followed my orders and they started settling a lot after that case. Um, but I was doing all sorts of cases. I was doing criminal cases, I mean, uh, drug cases, gun cases, all sorts of cases. Uh, one of the cases I did, um, one of our witnesses in the Parts and Falls case was a guy named Art Baldwin. Art Baldwin was a ne'er do well from Memphis, and he was a little connection to Fred Taylor. And Art ran a series of um, Strip joints. And one of them was the classic cat. And he, that, at the point in time, that was um, his ex wife's. And he was very upset that his ex wife had the classic cat. So he got a group of people to burn the classic cat. And they tried to burn the classic cat. And if they didn't, they tried to blow it up. And so that was another case I was involved with. Unfortunately, someone saw the bomb. 
in a car underneath the class cat. It was set up on uh, a second story and with a garage underneath, parking lot underneath. And, and someone saw it and they got it with about 20 minutes to go before it was going to blow up. So that was another case I was involved in, and all, all sorts of cases drugs, guns, environmental cases, criminal environmental cases, things. So unlike a lot of lo young lawyers, you really didn't have to look for work. It was we were, there for you. We were busy. At one point in time, was, I think when Joe Brown, just around the time Joe Brown became U.S. attorney, we were had shifted from eight attorneys to attrition, or nine, I'm sorry, it's nine. I think we were down to five. So basically, we were doing three or four down fires. But it was fun. I mean, we were busy, got to try cases. Who were the, you started with Hal Harden, who were the U.S. attorneys during your started tenure there? Hal, then Joe, then Ernie Williams, then John Roberts, I think it was Wendy Goggins next. And then um, I'm blanking on his name. Then there was another one. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. Then Jim Vines. Name for Jim. No, Ed, Ed Yarbrough was my last one. I think it was someone between Jim and Ed. Ed. So. Um. Let's skip here. I'm going to kind of set some parameters. When did you retire from the U.S. Attorney? I retired December of 2007. So almost 30 years. Almost 30 years. Yeah. And during those 29, 30 years that you were working in the U.S. Attorney's Office, what was going on in your life otherwise, with your family or civic activities or whatever else? Um, had two children. My daughter now lives in D.C. and works for IBM as a consultant to various government agencies. My son got the law enforcement bug and is a sergeant at the uh, Franklin Police Department now. Um, began repping soccer games through my son. He was playing soccer and I began repping soccer. Had you ever played soccer? I played soccer when I was in middle school and high school. I was not very good. The level of coaching was not what it is today. Um, but I enjoyed the game, and I still enjoy the game. Uh, I had been a runner for a couple of years and then destroyed my knees running, so I became a walker. I was active in my synagogue and, and other sorts of things. And then around 2003, uh, I was invited to start teaching at Vanderbilt Law School as an adjunct, so I started doing that. Tell me about your teaching experience and responsibility. Uh, I taught the basic trial ad course at Vanderbilt for a number of years, and then uh, Dean K, Dean Suke, asked me to help develop an advanced course for those who wanted to go into criminal law and continuing up with Rich McGee. And we, I think we're going into either a seventh or eighth year of teaching that, that class. Um, now, is there a separate class for civil and criminal or how, how? The basic class is just a basic class. You can either, we use case books primarily put out by NIDA. And so you can either choose a civil case book or a criminal case book. Um, I chose both. Do, you go through all elements of trial, you know, opening, direct, cross, experts, et cetera, and then it ends up in a mock trial. The advance for a number of years is taught by uh, Tim Warnock, one of the persons, name. I'm blanking on names today. They did a civil course, which was focusing in on depositions and things like that, and then Dean Kay asked me help create the civil side of that. And that's primarily for the civil or criminal. Uh, I'm the criminal side. I'm sorry. I'm doing criminal. And that was primarily for people who want to be either defense lawyers or prosecutors. 
we do have some people who come to the class who are, just want the trial experience. So we're doing in-depth. So we do, we do a lot on jury selection. We do a lot on cross, advanced cross techniques and things of that nature. And um, well, hopefully they're better when they go out. I know it's it, the training they're getting is far better than the training I got. I learned um, on the job. And as my good friend Rich McGee said, we trained them too well because one of the prosecutors is now in the DA's office and she just loves to kick, kick Rich's butt. <laughs> but he smiles about it because he, it feels good that, that she's, she knows what she's doing. And I took a whole semester of civil procedure back in the day. When criminal procedure required um, a semester's worth of, of... We had criminal law. Yeah, that, that, by that then, criminal which law, was... That's separate than right. procedure. I don't remember if we had criminal procedure. Georgetown was very strange at that point in time. Most of our courses were one-year courses, and you got one grade. So if you bombed the final, you really bombed the course. And it was torts and property, civil procedure, contracts. And it was there was a criminal, I remember first semester we had criminal law, which was mens rea, all that stuff. We, it may have been criminal. I don't remember. It may have been criminal procedure. If your, if your course at Vanderbilt, that she teaches Rich, mm -hmm. is it with a mastery or, or a Working knowledge of criminal procedure requires a semester's worth of class for similar to civil. Well, what they what the students have to take evidence first, and they have to take um, the basic trial ad course for before they can apply for our course. It's also an evidence course, so it's advanced trial ev evidence and. I forgot what the official title is, but evidence is a very important part of it. So we're doing evidentiary things with them. We, we, um, and then it's also ethics. We also have, have an ethics component as well. So it's it's taking them through a trial, like we'll do directs, we'll do crosses, but it's 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 much more fine-tuned and elevated than the basic. And we're doing the procedure too. I mean, right. Very arcane, it seems to me, from what I read sometimes in the paper about various motions and things. That... Well, we talk about some of the motions, but it's not really a procedure course. It's more of a, a, a trial course. Other than pardons and paroles and the, um, the you talked about a Classic. Variety of the classic cat, but I mean, you had a smorgasbord with everything from environmental right. to drugs to yes. whatever human venality in between. Um, any other cases of, of local note? That, that, uh, um, I was the lead prosecutor in the Faye Thomas case, okay. and that was three years of my life. And um, that was a very interesting case. Worked hard, hard on that case. We had, there were three prosecutors and um, three different agencies were involved. And I never had a case where agencies worked better together. How many agencies, which, which, which were the agencies involved? IRS, TBI, and the FBI. And different things started developing First started investigating Faith for one thing, and then it developed into another thing, and then it developed into another thing, and so it was. It, it ended up being a RICO case. Matter of full disclosure, I, that firm represented Faith up to the point of indictment, right? And my partner Bill Willis, I think, was going to be a witness, so we we did not represent Faith after the indictment. And I'm not sure I ever read the indictment. Quite frankly, I'm not sure what all he was charged. Well, it was RICO. There were a number of uh, different things. Um, part of it was uh, using the funds of the city to buy uh, food that they used in his barbecue business. 
part of it was using funds and people uh, for the reconstruction or the renovation of Faith's condo. There was a individual named Omar the Snake Man, Tommy Cowden, um, and he'd been a circus performer or, or and he was Omar the Snake Man, and he was given three hundred dollar three hundred dollar a month raise and forced to kick that back. So there were different tentacles in there, um, and different and and a number of people who were actually charged in connection with that investigation. That was the early nineties, I recall. Mm -hmm. you know, yes, you still had a ways to go to two thousand seven, but. Um, Anything else? Uh, any other cases? I had I had a few interesting. I had, along the way I became the appellate chief, and I enjoyed appeals. So I was reading all the briefs of everyone who was um, submitting a brief, and I had someone read my briefs and critique them too. And then I helped with the oral arguments. We we did a mock oral argument or a conversation with the people before they went up to the Sixth Circuit. And if people couldn't go to the Sixth Circuit, I liked going to the Sixth Circuit. So I said, okay, I'll go up for you. It fit in my schedule. Uh, and another big case involving um, these two individuals who came for Walter Presley and Salvatore Stallone. Uh, Stallone's a familiar name. Yes. Not a national person. Yeah, well, this individual claimed he was Sly's half brother. He was not. His real name was Bobby Joe Frosco. He changed his name to James Taylor legally and then changed his name from James Taylor to Talvatore Stallone because he was being, he said he was being confused with the real James Taylor. Let me just say there was no resemblance whatsoever. And so in the course of, and basically they had a fraud scheme where they were selling uh, distributorships of this particular type of uh, semi-drug, semi drug, semi a semi truck and trailer and rip people off for about a million eight. And um, during the course of the investigation, one of the things that happened, Presley would say that he was a cousin of Elvis Presley. Well, he could be a 30th cousin to claim that. But Salvatore Stallone claimed he was Sylvester Stallone's half brother. And so I said to the agent, go interview Sylvester Stallone. And it turns out Stallone, the real Stallone, was really pissed off and agreed to be a witness. And uh, we never brought him into trial because he was making movies, so I got to take his deposition. Very nice guy, too. And so that was a fun case. I tried that for five weeks before Judge Campbell. It was a long, long case. I had like 70 witnesses in that case because uh, a lot of them were you feel people who were employed by UPS um, over in North Carolina and ripped them off. So we had to bring all of them in. Um, I slept for about two weeks after that case because it was it was a long case. Five weeks? Five weeks. And how, how did you staff up for your trials? Did you have paralegals or? I had a paralegal helping me. I had a really good case agent. FBI agent who was terrific, but it was basically him and me. And uh, trial work was I averaged three hours of sleep. I worked through the weekends because I had all my other cases. So I'd have to come in on the weekends and work on my other cases as well. I had a paralegal or two helping me out in that case, so it was a it was an interesting time. Good result for the government. And then at the end of my career, I did a bunch of civil rights cases involving beatings in local jails. And we had three, one out of Smith County, one out of Wilson County, and I forget where the other one was out of. It was out of a uh, northern part of the district. And those were very difficult cases, um, but good cases to work on. Why were they difficult? I can think of reasons why, but specifically, what? Well, the sheriffs weren't happy with us, um, to be quite honest, and uh, jail administrators, one of them involved a death, which was very, 
one of one one an inmate was beaten to death by a particular group of uh, guards. One guard in particular when he was ordered to go do something to him. So those were difficult. We had to go through the death penalty um, protocol with the Department of Justice. Um, and we did not seek the death penalty in that case. And so they were difficult cases, both from what the facts of the case, as well as what, you know, just getting the cases to trial and, and prosecute. I've often wondered what it would be like to have investigators, FBI or the Postal Service or the IRS, seem to me that they would be quite a resource for you. By and large, yes, they were. Like any organization, everyone has their superstars and their, and their non-superstars and their regular guys. I think I was very fortunate to work with a lot of really, really good agents who understood that it, we were there as a team. And it wasn't, and that was the way we were gonna prosecute the cases. And they were, I was there to help them and they were there to help me. And so I was very, very fortunate. I mean, that frankly is one of the things I miss most about the job was that sort of relationship that I had with the agencies. But I practiced law with a former US, assistant US attorney and defense lawyer. And I've seen in television and other places that he, he would talk about this situation where the agent sometimes feel strongly about their case and they just know that so-and-so is guilty and the prosecutor may perhaps get dragged along or he's got to say no and lose a friend or make somebody mad. Is part of your training uh, did somebody help you deal with those situations that they might have developed or be, be aware of this situation because you, you might have to say no to a fellow here that you like who's helped you on some other cases but I'm going to go back to when I worked for Judge Moore. But within a month after I worked for him, he gave me one of the other things that he did was he would write opinions sometimes and give it to us and say, polish it. Did I miss anything? And he gave me one to read and he missed something. This is a federal judge. I had to go in and tell him he missed something. So I walked in and I said, Judge, I've read over this opinion. Miss something. What did I miss? So they're talking about this here, and you really haven't anything. He said, Okay, I'll fix it. And he said, You were scared coming in here. And I said, Well, yes, sir, you're a federal judge. He said, Don't ever be. And that was very important and a good lesson for me. And, and I thank Judge Morton for that. Did I have disagreements with the agents? Yes. Did we sometimes get supervisors involved? Yes. Were they very few? Yes. Um, because I think what we did, and, and I, a lot of that goes back to Hal and Joe, really created a, an atmosphere where we are a team. It's not you are the investigator, we are the prosecutor. We work cases as a team. And sometimes we disagreed and we would talk it out. And sometimes we might go to like Joe or Hal, who are the supervisors, and they might say, no, do it this way. But there were, I can honestly say there were never any hard feelings afterwards. We all worked it out. And so I think that that was one of the things, the pleasures of the job was, was being able to have that, that sort of conversation with people. It helps to feel that somebody's in the lawsuit with you from that, my personal experience. Absolutely. And, and I, um, we had great paralegals. They love to come to court. And I, would, I said, help me out. I'm, I'm computer challenged. According to my kids, I am computer stupid. Um, and um, I'd ask them to help me out with the computer, and it's one less thing I had to worry about. And I had the confidence in them, and they appreciated that. And I gave them lots of stuff to do. So 
we had, we had good people working. At some point, you decided to retire. Was 2007, I think you said. Yes. Um, sometimes it's, it's just, there may be unpleasantness, and, uh, maybe circumstances, or, or just it's, for some of us, it's just time to move on to something else. Uh, what brought about your decision to? Just a number of things. I was tired. I mean, those the civil rights cases I did were really all consuming and they were really tired. And it wasn't as easy to get up for trial if you know what I mean. Uh, my office had changed quite a bit. The administrations wasn't as um, cohesive. I don't, I think that, um, and people who have been in Nashville will know we went through a really bad time where with some of the U.S. attorneys and when you don't feel valued, when you don't feel part of the team, it's time to go. And it was just my, just my time to go. Again, not, no reflection on, on the last U.S. attorney I worked for at Yarborough. It was just, I was worn out. It was time to go. You know, I used to look up, used to like to go to office, even if it was, I was going to have a miserable day, I like to go to the office. And at a point in time, I looked at the building and I said, I don't want to be here anymore. And that was, and that was many, a number of years before I retired. It was, it's time to go. It's not worth it anymore. So I pulled the plug. What have you been doing since then? I know you're teaching at Vandy. Well. Teaching at Vandy. Um, I've tried to stay involved. At a point in time, Dean Suke asked me to write a book with her. So we wrote a criminal procedure book, but it was more, it was not just law. We would, we gave them scenarios and with video, we did videos. And that took us about two years. I will say not to enrich on that book for some reason. People have not bought it as much as I would like them to have bought. There's always the pocket parts. Yes. Um, so I did that. Um, traveled. Uh, we will, my wife and I did not do a lot of traveling when uh, we were young and when the kids were young. We'd basically go down to Florida for a week and go visit family up in New Jersey. So we started traveling a lot. And I've just enjoyed time volunteering. Now I'm working with uh, an organization through the Nashville Public Schools that provides clothing and shoes supplies to disadvantaged student, uh, children. Um, What's the name of that? It's called the HERO program, H-E-R-O, and I can't tell you what it stands for, but they've got a building and uh, they take donations. If students need, they, it's for the children who do not have a permanent home, and it's just not, home, it's not homeless people but it could be the child who's having to go to live with a different family member. And it's a really good program. And my wife and I have become very involved with that. Other things, you know, I've done as well, other volunteer stuff as well. Judged a lot of moot courts and mock trials, which are fun because I get to be the judge. I have to decide if I'm going to be judge arbitrary or judge capricious that day. I'm joking. Uh, well, you get to stay around young lawyers. Or, or that's true. Buddy lawyers. And and there are some really good lawyers out there. I judged the, uh, used to be the First Amendment uh, competition, used to be held here by John Siegenthal, who was still alive, and did a number of those. Those sorts of things keep me involved, involved with the National Bar Association. I've done some of the historical committee uh, CLEs, which are always interesting and fun. So, well, obviously, you and your wife decided to make Nashville your home. <laughs> and your, your career was here and you retired here. Well, it was funny because every once in a while she would look at me and say, Is this your career? And I'd say, Well, I don't know. I'm still having fun. She'd look at me a couple of years later, is this your career? And I'd say, well, I don't know. 
And finally, after about 20, 25 years, she looked at me and I said, yeah. Did your, work, did your wife work outside the home? She was genetics counselor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, she had a rich and challenging very career. Very. But not static, I wouldn't think. I mean, a lot of developments over the years. Oh, the thing she was doing when she first started, she first started in the lab and then became a counselor. The things she was doing then are, are they're way ahead of that now, what they can predict and how they. And she retired seven, eight, nine years ago, and she couldn't go back right now to work. She would take her a long time to get up to, to snuff because things have changed so quickly in that field. Do you have any parting thoughts or thoughts? Don't have to be parting, but do you have any thoughts about the practice of law or changes that you would like to see or the terms you may have? I think I was blessed by the fact that prosecutors, at least in my office, and the defense bar really got along together for the most part. There were exceptions. And that we could talk to each other, both the public defender and the private bar. You mentioned Bill Willis. I loved having a case with Bill Willis because he was a good lawyer, but we could talk to each other and we would speak to each other in person. I mentioned Rich McGee. Um, Rich and I had a number of cases together. We may not have agreed to each other, but it was always uh, an even clean case without name calling or anything. And I've heard the horror stories about New York and DC and LA where everybody files bar complaints against each other. We didn't have that. Uh, and I think the other thing that was important was if I had wanted to talk to someone over the public defender's office, I'd either call them up or I'd go over there. And I might talk to Sumner Camp or Henry Martin or those people. I think that is changing over time. And I think some of the newer lawyers are not making the effort to talk. They text, they email. And I think that is a big problem because no. I could look at Rich McGee and say, you're full of shit to his face. And he wouldn't get upset with me because he could see what I was, my face. You put that in a text, it's a different context. So I think that's one area um, that I think has changed quite a bit because I think with, with all the emailing and the texting, we've lost some of that contact. And this is... When Rich and I teach, we also have a, a uh, session where we talk with the students about the actual process of being a lawyer and what you should do, what you should do with the other side. They're not your enemy. I never viewed the defense lawyers as my enemies. We have different positions, but we're lawyers. I think one thing that the bar. No problem. Well, I think one thing that was initially with the Bar Association was I remember, and I'm sure you remember, remember taking the boats going up on Old Hickory Lake? No. It was one of the social functions. Getting together like that was just wonderful because it breaks down the boundaries. Um, I was with Inns of Court. And so we got to talk with each other and, and, and be with each other and, and those sorts of things, I think, are critical to a, a, a well-functioning bar. Because I think for the most part, again, I've been out of it for a while, but the lawyers in Nashville like each other. There are exceptions, but I think that's, that's a very important thing. And I think there was a lot of trust as well that I could say something, let's say to you, and you take my word. We might confirm it in a letter just for the record, 
but there was that sort of trust between us, and that was the way I wanted to practice. I think people, I think people accepted what I said as well. So that was important. Yeah, I think we could talk about. I'm sure there's, there are seminars about that, and whether it's technology separating people, the size of the bar people are used to not running each other at lunchtime, for example, or uh, just don't have the, the occasions to, to be with one another. So things like ends of court where you've got defense lawyers, corporate lawyers, bills and estate lawyers, uh, all kinds in a situation working on projects right. together. And then the Bar Association, the social events and their specific uh, uh, committees and other areas of focus on that. I agree with you. And I think the other thing that I'd mention is I got to know a lot of really good lawyers, both on the prosecution side, you know, like Joe and Hal, Hal Madonna. I mean, really, really good lawyers on the defense side. Charlie Ray, Vince Webby, Henry Martin. I mean, I could go on and on with the names of really good lawyers. Bill Willis, Al Knight. I mean, one of the fun things for me when I was clerking for Judge Morton was watching good lawyers. And I would sort of go into court, ask to go into court, and I saw some really good lawyering. And that inspired me. I wanted to be, I saw Charlie Ray do a cross-examination of, of a master sergeant in the Marines, and that guy hated Charlie Ray because he hated Charlie's client. And Charlie did a masterful job. And I walked up to Charlie after that. And I said, Charlie, that was really impressive. Charlie didn't win the case, but it was good to see good lawyers. And I think, you know, we in the bar need to do that more to inspire these young people with, by the way we handle ourselves and what we do. I think that, that was important too to me. Well, I think it's over the years I've heard new bar presidents come in and others talk about what are the issues facing the, the, the bar and the practice of law, the practitioner. And civility has been an issue over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the point being that people have been aware of it and been working on it. It's a recurring thing. It's not young lawyers come in, they're brash, they don't want to be run over, they're right out of law school. I know more than these old guys. They don't even know what the rules are anymore. So, and they want to establish their turf, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so they get a little offensive. I exhibit A on that. But at the same time, their older heads are talking to you about here's something really neat need to work on. Go so far with that kind of thing. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of productive. So I think the leadership of the bar. Um, and the various elements of the bar have worked hard at that over the years. And, and I, I think that's very important. I've also been involved in the mentoring program through the leadership forum that the bar does. I think I'm on my fifth or sixth person. And everybody's been different, but it's been just having those conversations with them about civility and things like that. I think, and I think it's very important for, for people to mentor. To help out the young lawyers because some of them need a lot of help, but some of them, it's just a, you know, a, a, if it's nothing more than a social thing, at least there's, they're having someone they can talk to about things. I, I think that's true. I mean, I mentioned Bill Willis. He was on the board of professional responsibility for a long time, was chairman, and he said the, the folks that tended to get in trouble was the sole practitioners mm -hmm. that didn't have anybody to. Bounce things off. They didn't have anybody to set an example. They were just kind of winging and just didn't know how to deal with, with the situations and they would get in trouble. So, um, mentoring, having somebody available, I think it's a good thing for the bar to practice for sure. Anything else? Said my piece, <clears throat> probably too much. No, uh, we've had a good session. I think we'll close now. And I appreciate it, Frank.